Thanks once again for tuning in to more NFL Draft Talk on Inside Arlad's NFL Depth Charts as we cover the Atlanta Falcons with Kevin Knight, editor and writer for The Falcoholic at thefalcoholic.com. And Kevin, uh, thanks for doing this again before the draft. We weren't sure if we were going to get an opportunity to talk to you before the draft, but we couldn't have picked a better day to do it. <laughs> yes, it's been a very busy day and it's good timing because, you know, we got all these signings and moves in just before we recorded. So, yes, and that includes uh, some running back moves. So this was something that, of course, we talked about with no girly, no hill. And you didn't think those guys were coming back. And obviously it doesn't look like they are. And then the corresponding moves today. Uh, tell us a little bit about the moves and also your analysis on those moves. Yeah. So the big one that was hinted at yesterday was uh Cordell Patterson from the bears coming to Atlanta. He visited yesterday and when the visit was reported, it was basically also reported that he was going to sign. Um, so they visited yesterday. Patterson was officially signed today. Um, and when the signing was announced that um, people listed the signing as running back slash kick returner, quarter Patterson. So it seems that they view him as more of a running back. I'm sure he'll take snaps as a receiver too, but um, it's interesting because the bears offensive coordinator, Dave Ragone uh, or passing game coordinator has come over to the Falcons. So there was a clear connection there. Arthur Smith has made it clear that he really likes these kind of chess piece players that he can deploy and move around and, and force defenses to, play something different than they're used to playing. Um, the Bears used Patterson as like a, a hammer running back. Like they're like, okay, you're 6'2", 230 pounds. We're going to you know, run you up the gut and smash for a couple of yards. And that was not really great for him. I mean, obviously he can get a few yards if you need it, but um, I'm hoping the Falcons will deploy him as more of like a wide zone guy and a pass catcher because um, I think his, his speed and vision in the open field is more impressive than his – in between the tackles yeah. running. Um, but, sure. Um, he's a weapon. Yeah, I mean, he is, he is. And they have Mike Davis for the in between the tackle stuff. So I don't think they're going to need Patterson for that role. Um, correspondingly, they released Ito Smith today, uh, which was a big surprise because Smith has always been a solid, you know, second or third running back. Um, he did deal with some concussions back in 2019 and people were wondering if he was going to continue playing. So I, we don't know if this was, the team wanted to move on or if Ito was considering retiring or if he just wants a break or, or maybe the team's just doing him a solid trying to let him catch on before the draft. But, um, so now that the running back room is, is <laughs> Mike Davis, quarter Patterson, all new, uh, former fifth round pick Quadri Olison, and then uh, former undrafted for agent, Tony Brooks, James. So they're going to draft a running back. That much is for sure. Um, but it looks like they've kind of maybe substituted Patterson for Ito Smith. Yeah, that's the thing that hasn't changed. Yeah. Is that there's still, and it's more than likely, again, unless they trade down, if they use their first pick at number four on, on a position, you, we, we kind of feel confident that that second pick could be a running back. Yeah. And if they trade down, that's where really we can, well, actually, before we start off, because we have, a, obviously, we want to cover everything to do with that pick uh and what they could do with that and quarterback and so forth the other move today was deron Harmon being signed and it's about time that the falcons added uh some necessary deep now look eric harris okay it's nice but deron Harmon gives him a you know good veteran a successful pedigree that kind of deal and they're not anywhere near finished with adding more dbs to the secondary though yeah, I mean, they they really needed safeties. They had three on the roster after the Eric Harris signing. Um, you know, Eric Harris being one, Jalen Hawkins being another one, last year's fourth rounder, and then um, under the free agent TJ Green were the only safeties they had on the roster. So um, adding Deron Harmon to be the nominal um, starter at free safety with Eric Harris probably playing more of a box role uh, is important for them. It doesn't it doesn't force them to take a safety on day two, which they were basically staring at without this signing. Um, and Harmon's good. Uh, he he did not necessarily have, he had his worst season in Detroit in 2020. And according to PFF, that he was still a, star, a solid starter. Um, normally with the Patriots, he was a good or better starter. Um, so I, I'm thinking the Falcons are hoping that in a better defense or at least better coach defense than Detroit's, um, 
they can get him back to a, a, a solid or better level. Um, and really what the safety signings scream to me is that Dean Pease wants to rotate safeties. Um, both Eric Harris and Deron Harmon can play box, can play single high, and can play um, cover two, you know, split zone type stuff. So one of the hallmarks of his defense when it's been the most successful is that he likes to rotate those safeties. He likes to, to do, you know, cover one robber, and he likes yep. to do um, – those different things and Eric Harris, you know, not a great deep safety, but the value of disguising coverage and having him not be a liability there, um, you know, is obviously a good thing. Harmon's probably going to be the deeper safety on most plays. Harris going to be more the box safety on most plays. And then we're still going to get a rookie in here. We just don't know at this point, it might be day early day three. It still could be day two. It, they're probably just, they're just setting themselves up to kind of not be, pigeonholed into we have to take a safety here uh instead now they might be like oh it's the third round kenneth gainwell's here we want to take him we don't want to take you know andre cisco we want to take we would prefer the running back so they have more flexibility to do what they want there but you would you would agree though that even though on paper just taking a look at the on my second monitor with the r lads depth chart where you have you know some young corners sheffield and Ter terrell was a first rounder and the team just signed Fabian Moreau as a depth guy. And there's another guy, Isaiah Oliver. And we've talked about these guys a few weeks ago. All right. They're high draft picks and there's a lot expected of them. But Terrell is really the only guy that you can feel. All right. He was a rookie. We're expecting big things from him this year. But you got to have someone else, a corner, don't you? And, and it could. And, and again, this could be why the Falcons could be an interesting trade down. Because I know on mock drafts you're seeing, and I even think on the Arleds mock draft that we did, we did a seven-round mock draft, and I believe that the person who had Atlanta took Sertain with the Falcons. And the thing I was thinking of is, all right, that's a need. I can see that. But at four, I, I don't know. I could see this being, all right, maybe Falcons move down a few spots. That's where if they want to take a corner, it would make a little bit more sense. And then they maybe add an extra pick somewhere late first, early second, something like that. But they got to get another corner. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're definitely still looking at corners. Um, they're, I think they're hoping, you know, I think they're happy with A.J. Terrell. I think they know he, they, they believe he can be their their cornerback one. Um I think they're hoping they can get more out of Fabian Moreau than Washington ever did. They just didn't really give him a lot of snaps. And, you know, he's certainly got the athletic profile to be good, but he's probably be best served as like your third or fourth corner. Um, and Oliver, I think they want him to play the slot where he was a lot better um, this past year. But again, like that's not a cornerback group you feel great about. So, yeah, they're definitely going to look at corner. And a trade down is probably the most likely path to them getting an impact starter at corner. But... Um, yeah, I don't think they're going to be considering any corners at four. I mean, um, Sertan is, is good. Uh, so is Farley, but they're not top five pick no. good. No. Um, so, I mean, yeah, if they, if they don't take a quarterback at four, it's it's probably going to be one of those other guys like Kyle Pitts or Panay Sewell. I don't really think they're considering defense at four. But a trade down to like nine with the Broncos, they could absolutely take Sertan at that point. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's now segue into the main reason that we thought we were going to talk to you today before all <laughs> these deals came about, and that was the fourth pick and the quarterback situation. Last time we talked, uh, obviously, the whole Matt Ryan contract and more than likely, that's still the same. W what is your feeling now that you've had a little bit more time to get the vibe with the new regime and whether or not mm -hmm. you believe that if they hold on to the fourth pick and they cannot trade it, that they will not use it on a quarterback and that they are going to use it to try and put more pieces around Matt Ryan for maybe one or two more years. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think they're going to take a quarterback if the one they want is there. Um, we don't know which one it is. I think they've gone to extreme lengths to make that a secret. Um, because we've heard basically nothing. There's been maybe some buzz about them wanting Trey Lance. Uh, there hasn't been anything about Justin Fields. But um, I, I think if they want Fields or Lance 
and one of those guys is there at four, they will take that quarterback. Um, okay. Unless, unless like a Godfather deal comes in, like Washington calls and is like, "Hey, do you want our next three drafts?" And we'll, you know, yeah, yeah, I do want that. So, uh, so if that happens, who knows what would what they might do? But I think their plan right now is to wait and see, and if the court a quarterback or the quarterback they like is there, they'll take them. Um, the second choice would probably be to trade down. Um, I, I would say that they're strongly considering that. I think they're trying to extract a crazy deal for the pick. And I think if they don't get enough, they will not trade down. I don't think they're willing to just trade down for the sake of trading down. I, I think they want teams, they want to play hardball because they're not, they really do want to pick at four. I think, unless they can get a, a great return, um, and the other, you know, side of that would obviously be if the quarterback they want is no longer there, then it will be Kyle Pitts. Um, and I, I assume that it will be Kyle Pitts, uh, just because he'll be the best player available. Um, you know, generational prospect. Uh, and Arthur Smith is maybe the most tight end happy offensive coach in the league. Um, the Titans constantly used 12 personnel with multiple tight ends on the field. They targeted the tight end, I think a a top three rate in 2020. Um, Smith has talked at length about how he views tight end as a chess piece. And he likes to use multiple of them to confuse the defense and force the defense to choose between playing base package or nickel against a, you know, a heavier set. Um, So I think that they are strongly considering pits at four as well. Um, So if they can't get the quarterback they want and they can't trade down, Pitts is probably going to be the pick there. Okay. So who do you think is the quarterback they want? I mean, I think they want fields. Um, I think most teams want fields and they're being really, really coy about it. Um, I don't know why (laughs) everyone is so obsessed with tearing down fields, but I mean, to me, he's the clear cut number two quarterback. And I I don't think the other ones are really that close to him. I do really like Trey Lance. I absolutely view him as a, a top five caliber quarterback but compared to fields who is has so many fewer questions in my opinion about him um i i just would not hesitate whatsoever to take fields and i'm not sure i would even entertain calls for the pick if he was still there um with lance it's it's more of a a toss-up i mean i i would take lance at four um unless there was a crazy offer. I do really like Lance and the Falcons are a really good fit for him because they have absolutely no pressure to play him. Um, they could even give him a second year if they absolutely needed to. I, I don't think that they will do that. Um, but Lance's would be coming to an ideal situation. His college offense is going to be very similar to Arthur Smith's. Um, and obviously his ceiling is, is sky high, just like Fields and Lawrence. So, um, I think both of those guys are great. I think they would prefer to have Fields. Um, but Lance there, I, I don't know that they would be willing to pass on Lance either. So, so you I guess, think that unless then, well, I mean, it sounds to me that you're kind of hedging your bet here that we're going to see four quarterbacks go down in the first four picks. Yeah. I think one way or another, four quarterbacks are going in the top four picks, um, whether Atlanta takes them or they trade down. Um, I would say there's maybe like a 20% chance the Falcons stay at four, uh, and take Kyle Pitts, but the other 80% is that they either take a quarterback or trade down. Okay. And how about the fans? What, what, is there a consensus? (laughs) No, no, there's a civil war, uh, more like more, more aptly. Um, there, yeah, we actually dedicated our entire Falcoholic live show last night, uh, which is on YouTube, by the way, guys, if you're interested in, in checking out another live show, um, we dedicated the whole show to debating what to do at number four. Uh, and there are factions within the fan base that have very strong opinions about this and it makes sense, right? I mean, Matt Ryan is a franchise icon, the best quarterback the team has ever had former MVP, um, so there's obviously a lot of feelings involved. Um, you know, I, I am pro quarterback, but it doesn't have anything to do with Matt Ryan. I still think he's a top 10 quarterback who can be an MVP caliber player with a good offensive coordinator, which he hasn't had since Steve Sarkeesian in 2018. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's not about Ryan's skill level. It's about Ryan's age and contract. Um, because I think you you could easily get two or three more good years out of Ryan. Like, I don't think that's a stretch at all. Um, so that's why it, it wouldn't shock me if they traded down because it, the, and they're saying, look, we've got at least two to three years of Ryan. Let's trade down and maximize this. That is one faction of the fan base. That's like, we love Ryan. We don't need a new quarterback who's going to sit potentially for a year or two. So let's trade down and maximize. There's also the pro Kyle Pitts group. Um, 
who just love Kyle Pitts because Kyle Pitts is awesome. So, and they're like, look, we get an elite weapon. Worst case scenario, Matt Ryan, you know, leaves in a few years, and then we have this generational tight end to build and help another rookie. Um, and I think that's reasonable too. And then we have the quarterback at four group, which is there's not there's unlikely to be a better opportunity to get a quarterback for the Falcons. That's not you know, when you can get a potential franchise quarterback without a trade up by just sitting yeah. and, and getting a quarterback where you are in the draft. That is not an opportunity that comes around for a lot of teams, unless you're planning to be picking in the top five, like the Jets yeah. every year. Yeah. Um, and see how well that was, that's worked out for them. It hasn't worked out super great. So the Falcons are, I'm guessing, thinking this is going to be the last time that we're picking in the top five, unless we like fleece someone on a trade down or something. Um, so we need this, like, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they decide like, look, this is our chance. We need to take a shot at this guy. And like, look, if it doesn't work and the quarterback is not who you want, you can just keep Ryan, try to trade the guy. And you still only gave up one first round pick for the shot at a, a potential 10 to 15 year franchise quarterback. I just, the calculus on that to me is, is what kind of makes me lean towards that option. Okay. And, and, and again, the contract update, the contract situation. So we, we know Ryan based on his contract is locked in this season. What mm -hmm. happens if they draft a quarterback? Does that, is that, that's it. It's guaranteed that Ryan will play one more year and then the Falcons will what release Ryan after the season, if so, when and how much will it hurt their cap situation? Yeah, I mean, no matter what they do next year with Ryan, unless it's like a post-June 1st cut, it's going to be a massive dead cap hit. I mean, it'll probably be in excess of $40 million. Um, They will still save money because <laughs> his cap hit next year is almost $50 million. But um, my guess would be that they the ideal scenario for them is they take the quarterback they want at four. That quarterback is everything they hoped for. And also, Arthur Smith turns out to be a really good coach. The team is competing for the playoffs, you know, not necessarily making a ton of noise, but comp competing for the playoffs. It's a top five offense or so. And Ryan looks really good. Uh, my guess is they would be trying to trade Ryan before next season, um, right? Like in early March before his roster bonus kicks in. Um, and... They would be, you know, in an ideal scenario, Ryan has a great season. He'll be, you know, 36, approaching 37. Um, you trade him for what you're hoping is a first round pick to a team um, who is going to get Ryan at a very cheap contract. They will be only paying Ryan 23 million in 2022 and 21 million in 2023. So the receiving team will be getting a bargain on his contract as well. Um, so. I think it's there's a, they could definitely trade him for a, a premium pick, but a lot of that's going to depend on how well the team does. Um, so if they play really well, Ryan looks awesome. Sure. I don't think they'll have a problem getting a first rounder for him. Um, if it's more middling, I mean, they're probably still looking at a day two pick for Ryan. So, OK, so so again, though, if they were to cut Ryan after they can't trade him mm -hmm. for whatever reason, he's on the team after this year. They've got their quarterback ready to go for 2022. Yes. And they cut him, whatever, in February. Mm -hmm. uh, what do the Falcons lose on, uh, as far as their cap situation? Yeah. So if they were to cut him before June 1st, they would eat like 40 million or so in dead cap. Um, they would still million. save. Yeah, they would still save 8 million, technically. <laughs> <laughs> like they would still free up 8 million in space. Cause he's getting paid a ridiculous 50 million in, in cap hit next year. Um, it's all prorated bonus though. So, and there's nothing uh, they can do. There's no, I mean, wiggling. If no... they, I mean, they could extend him with void years, but they're, if they're doing that, they're not cutting him. Yeah. So, okay. um, and, yeah, and what mean, if they it, hold on to him for two years? So if they held on to him for 2022, they could cut him in 2023 and save like $25 million. Um, so 2023 is still very flexible with what they can do. Um, but I, I, I don't see him staying on the roster at his current cap hit in 2022. So it'll either be a trade at the very beginning of the league year, a post June 1st cut. And if they do it post June 1st, it will actually only be about a 25 million dead cap hit for 2022 next year with a huge save. It would, yeah, for 2022. Oh, so yeah. they could cut him post June 1st of 2022 mm -hmm. and their dead cap number would just be 25 million. Yeah. So that it cuts it in half and it splits it with 2023. So well, you would have bad. to pay 20 million in dead cap in 2023, but you would save, you know, 30 million in both seasons okay. because of how big his cap hit was still. So okay. that is an option too. 
Um, but or if they just if they don't take a quarterback this year and they go into 2022 with Matt Ryan as the starter still, they will likely extend him um, and they'll probably do it with some void years as well. So they'll probably give him like a nominal two year extension and then add tack on like two or three fake years, you know, void years to, to spread out his signing bonus. So interesting. And do you like these quarterbacks enough? Fields, Lance, do you like them enough personally that you're like, even if you can get Ryan three more years of, or, you know, three more quality years for Matt Ryan, do you, are you still, nah, I, 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 I think it's best because I like these guys. I think we can get another 15 years out of these, out of these young quarterbacks, as opposed to, yeah, you know what? I'm not totally sold on these young guys. Maybe it is better for us to hold on to Matt Ryan for a few years and build around him and then wait a couple more years to draft another quarterback. How do you feel? Yeah. I mean, I, I really like Justin Fields. I, view him as a, a, a number one overall pick type of player. If it wasn't for Trevor Lawrence, I think he would be the number one overall pick. But, you know, Lance is, I'm a little bit, I'm not as high on Lance. I, I am very high on Lance per consensus. You know, I, I have Lance as my quarterback three above Zach Wilson, which is, you know, a hot take for some people. But so both of those guys to me are our top five picks. Um, so I, I would not hesitate to take either one. And there's a lot of reasons why I would do it now for the Falcons. Um, you know, like I said, they have an opportunity to do it without giving up premium resources. They have an opportunity to let these guys sit and actually evaluate them and give them time, which I think is a lost art in yes. the NFL these days. Yes. Um, and they're technically not forced to give up on Matt Ryan if the quarterback isn't living up to expectations. Like, obviously, it would be a big mistake. It would, you know, not be great. But at the end of the day, you spent one first round pick for a shot at a franchise quarterback. Good obviously, point. it's a top five pick. Yeah. But it's not the if the 49ers take Mac Jones and Mac Jones is an average NFL quarterback. I mean, they screwed up yes. like they're getting fired. You know, if they mess up on this pick, um, say they take Lance and Lance never really pans out. And like they're going to 2023 and they're like, we, we can't start Lance. They extend Ryan trade Lance for a day two pick. And, you know, hopefully everything else is, is going well enough that, yeah. you know, you guys are, you're still competing because you still have Matt Ryan. So they have the flexibility to kind of wait and see with this quarterback. Um, and, you know, with all the things we talked about only spending one pick, yep. the potential to then, if you like the quarterback and he's w exactly what you wanted, then to flip Ryan for a pick, it's almost like it could end up being like just a trade. It's just over two years. Like you spend a f the fourth overall pick for a new quarterback and then you trade your old quarterback for another first round pick. And so it's, it's, I, I think that might be what they're eyeing. Um, the but again, too, it all has to work out, but <laughs> is, is you have the new regime, which yes. is usually you know, 90% of the time, it's usually we want our guy. And no matter how good the other guy was, we want our guy. And uh, so, and I think the, 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 the I think the, that 90%, that 10% though, does come from usually the better quarterbacks. And that's kind of where Matt Ryan is. He's not Aaron Rodgers, but he's that next step guy. And that's what might make the decision a little bit harder uh, because you just think about it, whether they take a quarter, let's just say they don't, what's it like you said, let's say they take pits and hold on to Matt Ryan. And then let's say that second round pick, they go ahead and take uh, the running back from North Carolina that you like Javonta Williams. Yeah. Javonta okay. Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what kind of offense is that going to look like? <laughs> it's going to be sick, man. Yeah. I mean, now they going to stop anybody. Fun. Like, but no. it'll be a fun offense. Four forty-five a game. You don't need to stop anybody. You know. Yeah. You seem to get in their way a little bit. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it, I can see that being very tempting of a scenario. Mm -hmm. You know that maybe and, and look. It's all going to depend though on the new GM. They're just not making the move to make it. It's just look if, if they like the guys that you like. If they like Fields enough. If they like Lance enough, then that's that's the guy that they're going to wind up taking. So. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that they'll stick to their board and they'll take who they want, but we just don't know who that is. It might be Fields, it might be Lance, it might be Pitts. I mean, we just don't yeah. know. Um, and I, I think they'll take who they want, and that's the thing. Like of those three, I don't think there's a wrong decision. I also don't think a trade down is a wrong decision. So it's kind of a unique scenario where, unless they do something totally out of left field like Mac Jones, which would unite the fan base in anger, um, I, there's really not 
a wrong move, at least from like an outside, we don't know how these players are going to turn out sort of standpoint. Um, I think you could justify a quarterback at four, you could justify Kyle Pitts at four, and you could justify a trade down. So it's kind of a uniquely good situation to walk into for this new regime. And it's definitely not Sewell. I think it could be Sewell. I, I think Sewell is less likely. They have three offensive tackles they like. Um, you know, Jake Matthews is a very good left tackle. You're not necessarily looking to replace him for another three years until his contract runs out. Um, just turned 29, I think. So he's you know got plenty in the tank. Yep. They have Caleb McGarry, a first round pick from just a couple of years ago. Obviously hasn't been great, but he was average last year. So I think you're probably willing to give him more time. And they also have Matt Gono, who had to step in and start a few games at right tackle and also look like an, an average to even above average right tackle. So um, I think they have tackles. I think they're okay there. They really need a guard. Um, so are you going to take Sewell at four to play guard in his rookie year? I mean, I'm sure he'd be a damn good guard, but I just don't know that no, they're going to do that. that. I think they're, they're more likely to just take like Creed Humphrey, Wyatt Davis. Yeah, I don't like understand. That That's the thing. I, I didn't understand when people were on these mock drafts and they were putting Sewell there. It's like, what are you doing with McGarry? I mean, I understand <laughs> yeah, I mean, he hasn't. But he's young. You didn't, it, and I know yeah. it's a new regime. They didn't pick him. But mm-hmm. unless they trade him, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me that you do that when you end. Don't you think McGarry will fit better in this new system? To me, that's the system he ran in college. I think this is going to be actually a winning situation for McGarry, that he actually might benefit the most by playing in a system that's better for him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the honestly the biggest offseason addition, offseason addition, maybe even regardless of what happens at four, is Arthur Smith. Um, and no one really talks about that because it's a coaching ad, um, and everybody thinks their coach is amazing. Sure. But Arthur Smith is one of the better offensive coordinators in the NFL. He's been doing it for a few years now, um, and he just kept getting better. I mean, it, a seventy-five percent red zone efficiency one year is like, wow, that's really great. That's a really great stat. That's really cool. It's never going to happen again. He did it again the next year, which was that seventy-five percent red zone efficiency was like ten points higher than the next closest team. I mean, he is really smart um, at, at coordinating an offense. And I think that change alone is going to be the offensive improvement the Falcons needed. Um, and like, I don't know that they, I, I yeah, mean, I mean, Dean Pease too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, now that's going to be the so, interesting thing to keep an eye on how they construct that defense because of the players. But it's interesting, you know, with Fowler, here's another guy that benefits with Pease. Don't you think? Because when Fowler had his best season with the Rams a couple of years ago, you know, he, they, they use him in a variety of different roles, but he could, he, he looked pretty natural playing, you know, that kind of edge rusher in the three, four type of, so I can see even Fowler benefiting uh, and ha- him having his second best year under Pease in this new system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone will benefit. I think the Falcons, had terrible coaching and they have had it for a few years. Um, and it, it, that alone, I think will make a difference. You know, that alone is not going to turn them into like Super Bowl contenders, but it's going to get them out of the dregs of the NFL where they've been languishing for the past few years on terrible decision-making. And, um, it, it, that alone is just going to make a huge difference. And it's hard to quantify that before the season starts, but, um, I, I think they're just going to be a better team. Regard- like, they haven't even drafted yet, and they're a better team than they were <laughs> in 2020. So, uh-huh. um, you know, we'll see what happens in the draft. I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I think that regardless of what they do at the top, they're going to be in position for an exciting future. So, I agree with you. And we'll find out whether or not Matt Ryan is going to be a part of, well, how long of that the future? The long-term future, yeah. yeah. Well, Matt yeah, Ryan. I mean, at least a year. <laughs> at but least we'll one year, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so you talked about your YouTube channel. Uh, how often are you doing that? Because uh, this is the time, if you're a Falcon fan, to tune in. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's Wednesday. Every Wednesday, 8, 10 p.m. Eastern. We'll also be live during all three days of the draft. Um, just covering that. That's a lot of fun. Good show. Um, and we also just have like non, non-live non recorded videos that we post up there a couple times a week. Um, so I'll have one on Corderell Patterson tomorrow. Uh, awesome. So, yeah. And I uh, also want to let everybody know this is I haven't even yet in my own mailbox received the two, the 2021 draft guide from our lads. This is last year's, but uh, they are being mailed out today 
So you can order it at ourlads.com and receive it real soon in a matter of just days. Uh, you, you, did you get your PDF? I did. I haven't had a chance to look past the cover page at this point, but yeah, I'm Excellent. excited to take a look yes. at that. Yes, and it's a lot of, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fun, right? It's like, uh, it's like a Christmas present. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. All these draft guides are great. Yeah. Um, I've really been enjoying. There's a lot of great draft content out there. That, um, you know, the the rise of the Internet, I think, has led to a lot of folks. Our lads being one and Draft Network, another one that I really like um, having just some tremendous additional draft content. I remember back in the day, it used to be you go to the store and get a magazine. And that was like all the, the news, all the information yeah. you would or have in the entire draft class. Yeah, that's or it. Kuiper. It was yeah. just Kuiper. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, in the beginning, the early stages of the Internet, you had to weed out yeah. guys that were <laughs> so-called draft experts and so forth. Uh, and it, it took a while. But I think right now there have been a certain number of these guys that have been around for a while. And I know, of course, Dan is one of them. And uh, it, it was funny when I first met Dan online. Uh, he was at that point early on when it was like, you know, he took it offense to it because here's a guy that was a professional scout in the NFL for so many years. And here are these, you know, Johnny draft, you know, uh, kingpin <laughs> that's trying to, you know, make a name for himself without absolutely any professional background whatsoever. Uh, but it's, it's good for everybody. It's one of those things mm -hmm. where, yeah, there's a lot of, Eh, but it, it it just makes the industry that much better in the long run. And he, and uh, it, it's been great for our lads and it's great for fans. And mm -hmm. yeah, this is going to be awesome. And it's great for you and me because as, as uh, we had a terrible season last year, the jets and the Falcons. <laughs> so yeah. uh, we both can't wait uh, to get this draft underway and to see uh, what, 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 what new players we get to kind of get our, our teams back in the right track. And we look forward to talking to you, Kevin, after the draft and uh, that will give us an opportunity to wrap up the Falcons offseason. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to it. All right, Kevin. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Yep. Have a good one.